from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston. It's the Cube, covering IBM Think. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Dave Vellante of the Cube, and you're watching our continuous coverage of the IBM Think Digital 2020 experience. And we're really pleased to have Rob High here. He's not only an IBM fellow, but he's he runs the he's the vice president and CTO of the IBM Edge computing initiative. Rob, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Good to see you. Wish we were face to face, but yeah, hey, this will do. Appreciate that. It's uh, time to be safe and healthy, I guess. Indeed. So Edge, uh, obviously a hot topic. Everybody has this sort of point of view. Would be interested in how IBM looks at Edge, how you define it, and what your thoughts are on its evolution. Yeah, well, you know, there's uh, really kind of two fairly distinct ways of thinking about the edge. Uh, the telcos are, uh, you know, they're creating edge capabilities in their own network facilities. We call that the network edge. Uh, the other side of the edge that that uh, I think matters a lot to our enterprise businesses is uh, those remote on-premise locations where they actually perform the work that they do, where the majority of the people are where the data that actually gets created is first formed and where the actions that they need to uh, operate on are being taken. That is a lot of interest because if we can move work workloads, IT workloads to where that data is being created, where those actions are being taken, uh, not only can we dramatically reduce the latency to those decisions, uh, but we can also ensure continuous operations and the in the presence of perhaps network failures, we can manage the growth of increasing demand for network bandwidth as more and more data gets created. And we can optimize the efficiency of both the business operations as well as the IT operations as a part of that. So for us, edge computing at the end of the day is about moving work where the data and the actions are being taken. Well, so this work from home, you know, as a result of this pandemic is kind of creating new stresses on networks and people are putting, you know, pouring money actually into beefing up that infrastructure as sort of an extension of what we used to think about edge. But I wonder if you could talk about some of the industries and the use cases that, that you guys uh, are seeing and, you know, notwithstanding the, the, as I say, the work from home pivot. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, look, we, we have seen uh, the need for placing workloads close to where data is being created and where actions are being taken in virtually every industry. The ones that are probably easier for us to think about and more common in terms of our, our mindset are, is manufacturing. If you think about all of the things that go on in a factory floor, the need to be able to perform analytic in the, in, uh, in the equipment and in the processes that are performed in the manufacturing floor. If you take, for example, uh, production quality, uh, you know, if you've got a machine that's putting out parts and maybe it's it's welding seams on metal boxes, uh, you know, you want to be able to look at the quality of that seam at the moment that it's being performed so that if there are any problems, you can um, remediate that immediately rather than having that box move on down the line and, and find that, um, you know, the quality issues that were created earlier on now have exacerbated in other ways. Um, you know, so quality product, quality uh, inspection, uh, production optimization, in our world of COVID, you know, COVID-19 and, and worker safety and getting workers back to work and ensuring that, you know, people are wearing the masks and are, are exercising social distancing practices this is on the factory floor. You know, worker insight is another major use case that we're seeing surface suddenly uh, with a lot of interest in using, uh, whether that's infrared cameras or, or Bluetooth beacons or uh, infrared cameras, you know, any variety of devices that can be employed in the work area to help ensure that factories are operating efficiently, that uh, workers are safe, uh, and whether that's in a factory situation or even in an office situation or, a, or in a uh, warehouse or distribution center in all these scenarios, uh, the, the utility the edge computing can bring to those use cases is tremendous. And a lot of these devices are, are unattended or you know, infrequently attended. I always use the windmill example 
Um, you know, you don't want to have to do a truck roll to figure out, you know, what the dynamics are going on at, at, at the windmill uh, so I can instrument it. But what about the management of those devices, you know, fr from an autonomous standpoint? And, and are you, what are you doing or are you doing anything in the autonomous management space? Yeah, in fact, that's really kind of key here because when you think about the scale, the diversity and the dynam dynamism of equipment in these environments and as you point out, Dave, you know, the lack of IT resources, the lack of IT skills on the factory floor or even in the retail store or a hotel or distribution center, in any of these environments, the, the situation is very similar. You can't simply manage getting the right workloads for the right place at the right time in sort of the traditional approaches. You have to really think about an autonomous approach to management and you know, letting the system decide for you what software needs to be placed out there, which software to put there, if it's an analytic algorithm, what models to be associated with that software, and getting it to the right place at the right place at the right time uh, is, is a key part of what we do in this thing that we call IBM Edge Application Manager. And it's that product that we're really kind of bringing to market right now in the context of edge computing that facilitates this idea of autonomous management. You know, I wonder if you could comment, Rob, on just sort of the approach that you're taking with regard to providing products and services. I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, situations where people are just essentially package, packaging traditional, you know, compute and storage devices and sort of throwing it over the fence at the edge uh, and saying, hey, here's, you know, our edge computing solution. Now, and, and I'm not saying there's not a, a place for that. Maybe that will help flatten the network and you know, provide a, a, a gateway, you know, for storing uh, and maybe processing information. But it seems to us that that it that at a bottoms up approach is going to be more appropriate. In other words, you've got engineers, you know, uh, who really understand operations technology people, yeah. maybe a new breed of developers emerging. How do you see the evolution, you know, of products and services and architectures at the edge? Yeah, so first of all, let me say IBM is taking um, a really pretty broad approach to edge computing. Um, we have what I just described as IBM Edge Application Manager, which is the, if you will, the platform or the infrastructure on which we can manage the deployment of workloads out to the edge. But then add to that, we ha do have a whole variety of edge enabled, enabled applications that are being created, uh, our global service practices and our AI uh, applications uh, business all are creating um, variations of their product specifically to address and exploit edge computing and to bring that advantage to the business. And of course, then we also have global services uh, consulting, uh, which is a set of skilled resources who not only understand the transformations that businesses need to go through when they want to take advantage of edge computing and how to think about that in the context of both their journey to the cloud, as well as now in this case, the edge, but also then how to go about implementing and delivering that, uh, and then firmly, further managing that. Now, you know, couple that then with, at the end of the day, you're also going to need the equipment, the devices, whether that is an intelligent automobile or other vehicle, whether that is an intelligent robot or an intelligent camera, um, or if those things are not intelligent, but you want to bring intelligence to them, then how you augment that with servers and other forms of cluster computing that resides co-resident with the device, all of those are going to require participation from a very broad ecosystem. So we've been working with partners, uh, whether that is uh, vendors who create hardware and enabling that hardware and certifying that hardware to work with, uh, our management infrastructure, or whether those are um, people who bring higher order services to the table that provide support for, let's say, data caching and, and facilitating uh, the creation of applications, or whether those are device manufacturers that are embedding compute um, in their device equipment. All of that is part of our partnership ecosystem. And then finally, you know, I need to emphasize that you know, the world that we operate in is so vast and so large. There are so many edge devices in the marketplace and that's grown so rapidly and so many participants in that. Likewise, there's a lot of other contributors to this ecosystem that we call edge computing. And so for all of those reasons, we have grounded um, IBM Edge Application Manager on open source. 
Uh, we created an open source project called Open Horizon. We've been developing that actually now for about four and a half years. Uh, just recently, the Linux Foundation has adopted stage one adoption of Open Horizon as part of its Linux Foundation Edge, uh, LF Edge, uh, Edge X Foundry project. And so we think this is key to building out um, a ecosystem of partners who want to both contribute as well as consume value and create ecosystems around uh, this common idea of how we manage the edge. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the ecosystem. I mean, it's too big for any one company to, to, to go it alone. But I want to tap sure. your your brain on just sort of architectures, and there's so many diverse use cases. So, you know, we don't necessarily see one Uber architecture emerging, but there are some characteristics that we think are you know, important at the edge. You mentioned sort of real time or near real time, and uh, in, in many cases, it has to be real time. You think about autonomous vehicles. Um, yeah. a, the, the, a lot of the data today is analog, and maybe it doesn't have to be digitized, but but much of it will be. Um, it's not all going to be sent back to the cloud. Um, it may not all have to be persisted. Uh, so we, we've envisioned this sort of purpose-built you know, architecture for certain use cases that can support real time, that, that maybe have you know, ARM-based processors uh, or, or other alternative processors there um, that can do real time analytics at, at the edge and maybe sending yeah. you know portions of the data back. How do you see the architectures evolving from a technologist perspective? Well, so certainly one of the things that we see at the edge is a um, tremendous premium being placed on things like um, energy consumption. So architectures that are able to um, operate efficiently with less power is, uh, is certainly an advantage to any of those architectures that um, are being brought forward. Um, clearly, you know, x86 is a dominant architecture in any, information technology endeavor. Uh, more specifically at the edge, we're seeing the emergence of a lot of um, ARM-based architecture chips out there. In fact, uh, I would guess that uh, the majority of the edge devices today are now being created with um, ARM architectures. But mm -hmm. um, at the, you know, but some of this is about the underlying architecture of the compute but also then the augmentation of that compute, the, the, the compute, uh, the, the, uh, the CPUs with uh, other uh, types of processing units, whether those are GPUs, of course we're seeing you know, a number of GPUs being created that are designed to be low power consuming um, and have a tremendous amount of uh, utility at the edge. There are alternate, processing unit architectures that have been designed specifically for AI and model-based um, analytics, uh, things like TPUs and, and uh, MPUs and, and uh, et cetera, which are, are very purpose-built for certain kinds of analytics. And we think that those are starting to surface and, and become increasingly important. And then you know, on the flip side of this is both the memory storage and network architectures, which aren't sort of exotically different, but at least in terms of capacity, um, have quite a bit of variability. Specifically, 5G though is emerging. And 5G, while it's not um, necessarily the same as edge computing, there is a lot of symbiosis between edge and 5G. And the kinds of use cases that 5G envisions are very similar to those that we've been talking about in the edge world as well. Rob, I want to ask you about sort of this notion of programmability at the edge. I mean, we've seen the success of infrastructure as code. Um, how do you see the programmability occurring at the edge in terms of fostering innovation and maybe new developer models or maybe existing developer models at the edge? Yeah, we found a lot of utility in um, uh, sort of leveraging what we now think of as cloud computing or cloud computing models. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the idea of containerization uh, extends itself very easily into the edge, whether that is running a container in a Docker uh, runtime, let's say on an edge device, which is, you know, resource constrained and purpose built and, and you know, needs to focus on sort of a, a very small footprint or even edge clusters, um, edge servers, where we might be running a cluster of containers using our Kubernetes platform called OpenShift. Um, 
you know, in the course of practices of continuous integration, continuous delivery, what we might have otherwise think of as DevOps, uh, and the course of benefits that containerization brings to the idea of component architectures, uh, the idea of loose coupling, the separation of concerns, the ability to mix and match different service implementations to be able to compose your application are all ideas that were matured in the cloud world, but have a lot of utility in the edge world. Um, now we actually call it edge native programming, but you can think of that as being mostly cloud native programming with a further extension that there are certain things you have to be aware of if you're building for the edge. You have to recognize that you know, resources are limited, unlike the cloud where we you know, so have this notion of infinite resource, you don't have that at the edge. You have very mm -hmm. confined and constrained resources. You also have to be worried about you know, latencies and the fact that there is a network that separates the different services and that network can be unreliable. It can introduce its own forms of latencies. Uh, it may be bandwidth constrained. And those are issues that you now have to factor into your thinking as you build out the logic of your application components. But I think by building on the cloud native programming development paradigm, you know, we get to exercise sort of all the skills that have been developing and maturing in the cloud world now for the edge. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, uh, my last question is around security. I mean, I've often sort of tongue in cheek said, you know, building a moat around the castle doesn't work anymore. The queen, i.e. the data has left the castle. She's everywhere. So what about the security model? I mean, I feel like the edge is moving so fast. Do you, do you feel confident or what gives you confidence that we can secure the edge? Yeah, the edge is, uh, it does introduce some very interesting and challenging uh, concerns with respect to security because frankly, the compute is out there in the wild. You know, you've got computers in the store. You've got, you know, people walking around the kiosks. You have in the manufacturing site, you know, workers that are, you know, in the midst of all of this compute capability. And so the attack surfaces are substantially bigger. And that's been a big focus for us is how to ensure not only validate the integrity of the software that was created, but also, um, takes advantage of one of the key characters that the edge computing can bring to the table, which is if you think about it, you know, when you've got personal and private information being entered into quote the system, uh, the more often you move that personal and private data around, and certainly the more that you move it to a central location and aggregate that with other data, the more of a target it becomes, the more vulnerable and exposed that data becomes. And by using edge computing, which moves the workload out to the edge where that data is being created, in some sense, you can process on it there and never have to move it back to any central location. You don't have to aggregate it. And that actually in itself is a counterbalance to all the other issues that we also described um, about security by essentially not moving the personal and private information and, and protecting it by keeping it exactly where it began. You know, Rob, this is an exciting topic. It's a huge opportunity for, for IBM. I mean, Ginny and, and Arvind talk about the, you know, the, the trillion dollar opportunity in, in hybrid cloud. Uh, the, the edge is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity for, for IBM. And uh, so you just got to go get her done. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming on the, the Cube and sharing your insights. It's an awesome topic. And uh, best of I luck to you. I appreciate the David. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to and, talk about and, this and, stuff. And, and stay safe. And thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. This is our coverage of IBM Think 2020, the digital think. We'll be right back right after this short break. <laughs>